Hi, my name is Brett Levine and I am one of the members of the Patient Education Committee for the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. Welcome to our latest installment of videos for patient education. This video will include what is my total knee replacement made of. We will discuss multiple different topics including the materials that knee replacements are made of. I hope that you enjoy this installment and this short video to follow. As just mentioned, this is another installment for our patient education video series from the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. Again, this installment will cover in detail the individual components of a knee replacement, what specifically they are made of, including the materials and metals, how do they work together, and it will be highlighted in a series of pictures and videos to cover this relevant material to make it more relatable as you're getting ready to have a knee replacement or if you're just curious about knee replacement in general. All of our content for the Patient Education Committee can be found on our Patient Education Portal. Many of the materials are included in English and Spanish at this time. You can find this portal at https colon backslash backslash hipknee.aahks.org. You can download informational PDF documents, listen to podcasts, review exercises related to hip and knee replacement, and see our series of videos just like this one. To start, a total knee replacement is made out of four components or parts. There is a femoral component which goes on your thigh bone, a patella component which goes on your kneecap, and then with what we're going to start here are the two parts that attach to your tibia or shin bone. The first is a tibial tray. This can be made out of metal or all polyethylene, and this picture to the right here comes in different shapes and sizes. We'll cover in detail more about each of these parts in future slides. The second part is the liner. This is typically made out of polyethylene and serves as your new cartilage. It's what sits between the two metallic pieces and serves as the bearing surface for when you bend your knee. The final picture here shows the plastic locking into the tibial tray, completing the two parts that attach to your shin bone. To break things down a little further, the tibial tray has multiple different options. You can have a tibial tray where the plastic actually snaps into place, and that is called a fixed bearing option where the plastic locks into the tibia, or you can have a rotating platform tibia like the picture on the upper left where the plastic sits in the tray but doesn't actually lock into place. There are also multiple different metals that the implant can be made from. First is titanium, as pictured at the top, or cobalt chrome, which is the upper left. There are also hypoallergenic and coated implants, which are often a different color than the ones that were previously mentioned. These implants tend to be nickel free and are considered hypoallergenic for patients with metal allergies. The tibial component can have a porous coating. That is where the bone will actually grow into the implant, or it could be cemented into place, which again we will discuss in future slides. As mentioned in the previous slide, some of the implants can be porous where the bone will actually grow right into the metallic coating on the implant. Pictured here are tibial trays that are meant to cement. As you can see, the surface is a little bit smoother and the cement will go on the back of the tray as well as on your bone and you push the tray down, driving the cement into the pores of your bone, locking it in place like a grout. 
This holds the implants in place and is very successful in the long term. The second function of the tibial tray after gaining fixation is to hold the polyethylene liner. That's again your new, your new cartilage. It is the plastic that locks into the implant or can sit on the surface and rotate. The good part is that the plastic is modular, meaning that it is a separate piece. And in the future, if the plastic were ever to wear out, you could potentially change this as an isolated procedure and not have to change out the entire knee replacement if it were to wear out 15 or 20 years later. As with the tibial tray, the liner comes with multiple different options. The options include varying thicknesses of the liner, ranging from very thin all the way up to 20 millimeters or slightly greater than that so that it could fill whatever space is necessary. It creates a lot of versatility intraoperatively for the surgeon. The liner also has multiple options regarding the constraint of the implant. Pictured here are two of the options, both of which are based upon your surgeon preference and really clinically have no significant differences in outcomes. Additionally, the liner could come with a vitamin E additive, which is hard to tell here in the video, but it gives a little bit of a yellowish tan hue to the plastic and is meant to be an antioxidant to hopefully increase the longevity of the plastic. This seems to be the case in total hip and in early studies for the total knee, but it's something that the future will need to really play out for it to be used in all cases. As mentioned in a previous slide, the tibial liners come in varying levels of thickness and have multiple options. Pictured here, you can see that the different size of tibia has different thicknesses of the polyethylene available, and these are all color-coded. As we blow this up, you can see on the bottom part of the slide that one of the plastic pieces here is 10 millimeters thick, and another is 17. This ranges in different levels for the different companies. This allows us to balance your knee so it feels and moves as smoothly as possible. It gives us this tremendous amount of flexibility during the course of the surgery to make things feel the way they should after your knee replacement. As mentioned before, there are four parts to a knee replacement. We've already covered the two parts that attach to the shin bone, and we'll now move on to the femoral component, which caps off the end of your thigh bone, and the patella component, which goes underneath your kneecap. Both of these come in varying different options, which we'll cover in the next few slides. We will break down the femoral component in greater detail here. First, we'll start with what is it made from. Typically, the femoral component is a metal, and there are various different options. Titanium is an option for the femoral component, but in general, titanium is very soft as a metal and can scratch. Therefore, titanium implants require a special coating or treatment to the surface so it becomes more scratch resistant. Cobalt chrome is another option, which is the most common option for femoral components. This material is nice and shiny and relatively scratch resistant, giving good wear characteristics meaning that your knee replacement should last a long time, hopefully between 15 to 20 years. Another option are what we call ceramic type implants. These are essentially implants that have a coating or surface treatment that make them nickel free. These are the hypoallergenic type of implants that we use in the setting for patients that have a history of metal allergy. Overall, they should work very similar to the previously mentioned titanium and cobalt chrome implants. 
Secondly, the femoral component can be either cemented or cementless, just like the tibial component. And just as we mentioned on the tibial component, the cementless implant will have a porous surface so the bone can grow right into the metal itself, and a cemented version will be smoother where the cement will be placed on the back of the femoral component and on the bone and get that interlock into your bone much as a grout does like on tiles on a floor. There are a tremendous amount of options for both the femoral and the tibial component. The shapes are really not that much different amongst different companies. When you grossly look at it, they would look very similar, just as the generic outline of a car would look to anybody. However, one size does not fit all, and you can see in this picture, these are multiple different options, and these are just a few. Uh, there are oftentimes double this number for the various options to fit a femur and a tibia. Plus, you can often mix and match the femoral component with different size tibial components with different thickness of the polyethylene or plastic. This gives us a tremendous number of options and combinations that we can choose during the course of the surgery so that your surgeon can match you up with the best possible option for you. As mentioned in a previous slide, one size does not fit all. Pictured here is just one brand of knee replacement with numerous sizes. You can see that the width of the implant grows as the size of the implant gets bigger. This is just five of the sizes available for this one company for the femur, and there are also macro and micro sizes which are not pictured, which include two to four more implant sizes just for the femur. The implants also grow in width and height as they get bigger, so it fits all comers. On the bottom part of the slide, you can see that it also grows in this direction as the implant gets bigger, giving us a tremendous amount of versatility during the course of the surgery so that we can make sure that you get the right implant for you. The last part of the knee replacement is the patella. The patella comes in different shapes. It can be round and spherical, or it can have this anatomical shape as pictured on the upper right. Oftentimes surgeons will pick based upon their preference or the implant system that they choose to use. There are also cemented and cementless options for the patella. As we previously mentioned for both the femur and the tibia, a porous option or cementless option requires the bone to grow into the back of the implant. Cemented options, again, are the same where you place it on the back of the patella as well as on the back of your kneecap and the component and the bone will come together with the cement holding in place like a grout. The patella comes in multiple different sizes, just as the tibia and the femur and the liner mentioned previously. However, another option for the patella is that some surgeons will elect to not resurface the patella, meaning that they do not place an implant on the back of the patella. There are two pictures here, and the top x-ray shows the patella sitting on top of the femoral component with a space. This space is filled with the plastic patella component or polyethylene in which the patella is made from. This is the same polyethylene that the liner is made from. The bottom picture, however, is a case in which the patella was very normal and had a good cartilaginous surface. In this case, the surgeon elected to not resurface the patella and leave the native patella intact. And this then can sit in the groove of the knee replacement and function quite well. The jury is still out on which way is better, and in the end, reported outcomes are very similar between the two options.
So what does this look like when it all comes together? Here's a picture on the left of a model and then a schematic which shows all four pieces coming together to make a successful knee replacement. You have the femur and tibia which line up over the top of each other with the plastic or polyethylene that sits between them. You have the patella or kneecap which then sits in the groove of the femoral component which is on your thigh bone and that helps move back and forth staying in the groove. All four pieces coming together makes this a total knee replacement. This is what ultimately gives you your new knee which will hopefully last you 15 to 20 years and improve the quality of your life. The previous slide showed a picture of what the knee replacement looks like coming together and now this is a series of x-rays showing a similar finding where you could see an x-ray looking straight on to the upper left then on the upper part on the right you can see the side view of a knee replacement and then on the bottom you can see what we call a sunrise view where you can see the kneecap sitting on top of the femur and this is how it all comes together again lining up nicely <clears throat> and with the kneecap in the groove you can then bend your knee smoothly and it will move back and forth with good strength and power ultimately if you work very hard after the surgery you can have an excellent range of motion and have a quality of life that is restored back to how it was before you were limited by your arthritis. With hard work, an excellent range of motion can be achieved. And this is critical ultimately for your function and your happiness after the surgery. It does take a fair amount of work on the patient's part to be able to do this. While it's the surgeon's job to get the implant in and have it fixed to the bone and aligned appropriately, it is your job as the patient to work hard to achieve a good range of motion and improve the quality of life. This is a picture and video of a model knee replacement and you can see how when it comes together the knee will bend and straighten smoothly and you can achieve a good range of motion. I hope that you enjoyed this video in reviewing the different parts of a knee replacement and what they're made of. Once again, thank you for tuning in to this episode of our video series, What is My Total Knee Replacement Made Of? Please stop by our website for more patient educational videos, articles, exercise outlines, and podcasts. You can find us on the web at hipknee.aahks.org. I thank you for your time and attention. Have a good day.